Did you have your hand up over there? No? Oh, sorry, just... <laughs> yeah. I have a question and comment. The first question is, I'm asking the panel, what do you think of the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that's going on now? And this, the comment I have is, regarding what you mentioned, you know, the fractured the homeland, the whole Mother Earth is fractured. And I think in addition to what you mentioned about unity of land, I think we, this world will need unity of mind and spirit that will bring maybe faster solution. Anyway, I'd like to hear about the first question. <laughs> I thought about that question because I, I uh, you know, for a whole term I refused to let students write about residential schools because they simply didn't get it. Uh, it was, it's too difficult of a subject to, uh, to analyze in, in one course. Um, and so we simply said, you know, write about other things that, that are easier to write about. Um, having not gone to residential schools, I have also a perspective that, uh, you know, I don't have a first person account uh, so it's, it's, it's hard for me to relate to what other Aboriginal people in this country relate to in terms of, uh, in terms of residential schools. Um, I did have a friend, though, who worked on residential schools. He was a computer programmer. And uh, when he first took over the, when he first took that job, he said, this is the most important thing that I've ever done in my life. And he helped design the computer programs that would help dispense money to victims of, of uh, the residential schools. Um, Patrick committed suicide about two two years ago at Christmas time. Um, residential schools represent for I think for Aboriginal people uh, just terrible terrible medicine. And um, I'm not so sure that we're ready for truth and reconciliation because I think that what we're being asked to do by the government of Canada is simply reconcile ourselves to the past. I can make a little comment uh, with regard to residential schools. I sit on, a, on the review committee, and, as Bonita pointed out, and one of the ladies from Pickwaknagon uh, was a, a child that was sent to residential school. So she uh, she explained something that was rather shocking to me. She said, when I was bad, or when they said I was bad, my punishment, because a lot of children died in residential schools, her punishment was to sit in the dark all night with the body. This is someone who uh, still with us. You know, this isn't that far back. So uh, it, it just just a little information that came firsthand from a victim of the res residential school system. Yeah, I was interested that uh, the Barrier Lake came up because I, I when I was reading the chapters of when you spoke, which I think is fantastic. I was simultaneously watching the videos that were being posted by Ipsmo and Barrier Lake Solidarity, and then more recently watching the videos from the Wawaki family. And, and the thought struck me, what Benita's talking about that happened in Ontario 150 years ago, it seems like it's being a replay in 2012. It's sort of like the same thing where the forestry companies are making uh, a lifestyle uh, connected and being supported by the land impossible. And it, it seems like uh, it's the same thing, only 150 or 200 years later. Am I off the wall in, in having that thought? Is that, is that incorrect? Or? No, it, I was thinking too, like things haven't changed. Like it, it's, um, yeah, how, and then you want to talk about what's reconciliation. Recon what's reconciliation, reconciliation. 
it, it's it, it's it's a wider it's a bigger concept of what a reconciliation is well going back to this truth and reconciliation it's always like they want a quick fix like fix those Indians now let them give the money let's move on and the reality is I think this has been done over generations and generations and the impact is over generation to generation so and even an example going back to Barrier Lake uh, this is a couple of years ago it's not even that, it's like two, three years ago. It, it's, it's a clash of systems. What happens when you live with the land, and, but then you've got to go into a court system that, and it, they didn't have money for representation. Yet it's, it, they have every right to be there. That was their, it's the ancestral lands. So, but then they have no resources to go into the court system. Because it costs all this, it always comes back to money. So it is, I think, the same. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to make one more point about the truth and reconciliation is that truth and reconciliation isn't just happening in Canada, it's happening in about 106 other countries. And it's usually uh, fostered by G8 countries uh, and their settler uh, colonies. Because <coughs> they want to get rid of the problem, they want to get rid of the argument and move ahead. But there's a there's a definite pattern. Just a quick comment. I, I do agree with you. I think it's also driven by guilt. Um, and for part of what TRC is doing, there's there's obviously some good that's coming out of it. But I was they're putting on a conference that I saw coming up in Winnipeg, which is entitled uh, Truth and Reconciliation. Why can't or, or sorry, residential schools? Why can't we get over? And I was horrified by that title. And, I, and so I, we got into a dialogue about it. And I said, and I, and I was telling them that this is part of our community's healing that we're doing internally. It's for, it's for us. You don't get over abuse. You never do. Um, when you're part of an abuse, it's not something that you get over. It's not something that you can get over. You carry it with you forever. And your generations even feel it. Um, continuation. So, you know, I, I talked to Basil Johnson on this and he opened my eyes because I've been given a lot of these stories, much as you had said, about uh, deaths and, and uh, people watching their sisters be killed, uh, brothers be killed in residential schools in front of them. Uh, and, but they want their voices to be heard, but they want their voices to be heard in, in ways that are meaningful to their community and to their members. So yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. I love your opinion. I mean, I, with all these stories that they've been giving me, I've always said I'm starting to collection and put them into a book. You know, I asked Basil about this, and he said, oh, be careful with that one. He said, you got to be really careful where you go with that. So that would I be said, 30 years in the writing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I said, well, you know, I, I've been charged with it, obviously, by some of our grand grandmother and grandfather, so I've got to do something with it. But then putting it into words, too, just seems wrong. But it's about healing us. It's about communities. And that, that title just horrified me. And the fact that it's ongoing. Um, I always remember what Ward Churchill said about healing. In order to heal, you have to stop twisting the knife in the wound. Yeah. And, and really, so many things that are, are re-happening and continuing to happen, uh, the conditions under which they are taking place, um, um, yeah, um, my former roommate, I mean, her mother is accepting the money so that her kids can buy a house, you know. Well, they know, but, you know, like, they, all of these things, it's, it's, it's about power and, and atrocity and uh, trying to make the best of it. But it certainly has nothing, I mean, like you say, the G8 company, the G8 countries are doing it, I say companies. <laughs> the G8 countries are doing it for a specific reason, to manage, uh, manage their... Um, uh, public image to all of those things. Yeah. Um, it's sort of going back to because um, this is happening globally. 
So um, I'm actually have an opportunity to go to Nigeria next month and, um, and meet my father, who comes from the Ija people who are considered indigenous to the Niger Delta. And so 70% of their land is, is, is basically managed by oil companies now. And their traditional way of life has been completely overturned because they usually their main source of protein was fish, but now there's pollution. But unfortunately what I see happening is, again, sort of going back to those fractures you were talking about, um, a lot of the energy is not... By the, by the people is not being put into fighting the companies, it's into fighting each other. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's actually led to violence between different ethnic groups who live in the territory trying to, because there's this idea that at some point they're going to get money from Shell or Chevron. So it's like we want to say who's going to really get this money, who's going to have the claim. And I'm just wondering, you know, thoughts on how do we get around that? Because the reality is, is that that is going to happen inevitably. People, you know, people want the cash because they can't get anything else back. It's, it's gone. Um, but then what ends up happening is we just turn on each other because there's, there's just so much that's been lost. Can I, can I build on what you're saying? Because I, I think a lot of Canadians are not aware of what, uh, what's going on. A few years ago, I, uh, well, not even a year, I, probably about a year ago, I uh, received a, uh, a news flash about an uh, area in Nigeria. Um, where there was sectarian violence. And whenever it says sectarian violence, I sort of go, that sort of tweaks something for me. And I, uh, I, I, there's more of a story here. And so I did some research, and what I found was that there were, the sectarian violence was between Muslims and Christians. The Christians happened to be uh, farmers, and the Muslims happened to be herders. Mm -hmm. And up until about 20 years ago, their land use was compatible. As soon as three Canadian mining companies moved in and began buying and, and dividing up the land again and fracturing it in different ways, uh, these two groups found themselves in competition with each other, in, in, in for basically for life and, a life and death competition. It's a scarcity issue. Although in my region, it's not between Muslim and Christian because Nigeria is a very big country, sort of randomly yeah. made by colonizers. So that's more the, the middle in the north. In Did our you region. Say Ogoni? Um, no, it's it's Ija. So it's actually um, it's an indigenous minority, but it's one of the largest minority groups. But also the Ogoni is also in the region, but they're a smaller community. It's a cure, and that's where these conflicts are happening is between these communities. Um, but yeah, so in our region, it's it's ethnic, it's not religious. But um, but yeah, it's um, you're right. Like the the whole st it's often over scarcity. It's over a sense of scarcity, the scarcity of resources. It's not somebody told, you know, an ideology. I wouldn't want to kill somebody just because they're different than me if I didn't think they were taking my ability to live. And then promising money. Yeah. Or, yeah, I would somehow get it back. But yeah. just ideas on how to move forward from that. Because, I mean, I think this, it is like what we're seeing happening in terms of the climate change. I mean, that's happening even more dramatically in, in many other parts of the world. It's more likely we're going to start fighting each other than fighting the companies. And so how do we, you know, how do we move forward from that? <laughs> That's a good question. Can I? <laughs> um, I, uh, I was at a, I, I gave a talk to a union group a couple of years ago, and uh, that question, that question came up like, how come Indians just can't, uh, you know, sort of pull themselves up by the bootstraps and, and claim the rights that the rest of us all enjoy? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, labor has decreased from about 40% in this country down to about 15%. I don't know if you know that, but uh, uh, labor is getting the crop kicked out of them really badly. Um, and there's, good, there's, there's reason for that, why, why parliament can pass laws or provincial parliaments can pass laws that uh, destroy unions. What I said to them was, you know what, uh, we're really not interested in your rights. In fact, the rights that you have aren't very good. Um, we had a right to live free on the land. We had a right to, you know, live communally with our neighbors and share resources and work together. Um, those were our rights. And, uh, you know, we had a right to build a house without asking anybody. Uh, all of those things. And when decisions had to be made, we came together and we, we made those decisions by consensus where you know, nobody took sort of precedent and told us what to do. We had to sort, of sort it out ourselves. 
and this is coming back to the settler guilt too, is that there's no reason for settlers to feel guilty. I mean, you're here. That's the way it goes. I mean, my my white ancestors were, you know, came here. I don't feel too guilty about that. But the fact is, your ancestors, the predominance of your ancestors came here with real low expectations of what it was to be a human being because the crap had been kicked out of you and the country you came from. And so you're, you're, you know, you've accepted this charter of rights and freedoms. Have you ever read it? <laughs> you know, it doesn't give you very much. You don't even own land. You don't. You own a paper title. As soon as you get sick or fall into poverty, either the bank or the township takes your property back. You don't own property. You have no right to own it. And that's what you've got to start to understand because when we start figuring out who's the problem, that's what you've got to figure out. I was also thinking that really in some ways the solutions are local. The solutions yeah. are the people mm -hmm. getting back together, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I like what you said, why can't they just get along, but those Indians, right? It's like that, right? Mm -hmm. Why can't they? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't say much, but that's no, I know. It's, it's of, not easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I could just step in quickly. We have about five minutes left for questions or comments. Okay. So we have time for closing song and selling the books. And selling the books, yes, I was thinking. <laughs> yes, and the, okay. I, just, uh, I want to thank you. You did a great service with writing this book, and we need all the information we can get. It's wonderful. And on that note, I was wondering, does anybody taking any kind of responsibility in terms of the government, in terms of public education for the general population, the, the mainstream of people in the Ottawa Valley? Because I come from BC, although I'm living here and teaching here now, and contract of land claims process has created a lot of backlash and division in BC. You might have heard of it. <laughs> but I'm thinking that there isn't much awareness, let alone education, about the Algonquin situation and the ongoing comprehensive claim process or any kind of general history or awareness of Aboriginal and Indigenous issues in this area. So I was wondering if you know of any public information sources or who maybe is should be held accountable for providing such, you know, if you can maybe speak to that. I would say it's certainly not the government <laughs> who are pumping out in disinformation about yeah. land claims at present. <laughs> I would say if you really want a, a good story, uh, check Al Jazeera out every now and then. Sorry? Al Jazeera runs some really good uh, uh, public information on Canadian Aboriginal people. But if the federal government is is promoting the land, is, is finishing the land claim, shouldn't they be at least semi-responsible for public education in this area so that there isn't a huge outcry and backlash when the thing comes to... One of the things I believe on that, and I'm just jumping in here, um, is that... Um, I, and I say that because Mi'kmaq people were denied uh, when when the when the um, uh, uh, Calder decision came that that uh, you know recognized that title uh, where had it, where it had it, where it had not been taken uh, had to be addressed um, and the Mi'kmaq were denied that even though there were only peace and friendship treaties because it was an area which had been superseded by law as they put it in other words too long had happened since settlers had been there for Mi'kmaq people to have any rights to make comprehensive claims. That was during the days when they thought comprehensive claims were about actually asserting title rather than losing title. But um, I really think that the Ottawa Valley, the silence about it is because it is the homeland of the government mm -hmm. as far as they're concerned. Like to them, it's their cottages. It's their, you know what I mean? It's like we don't talk about this area being under claim. I, that's my perception. I, uh, you know, I may be way off, but I really believe there is a silence about the Algonquin land claims. I believe because there, there's claims going on in Quebec now as well, isn't there a, a claim? I don't know. I'd, I'd assume that the big secrets that never get talked about. Um, I didn't know. Um, a friend of mine was actually asked if she would be a negotiator for the Algonquin land claim in Quebec, which is why I assumed there was one. Uh, but um, who, and she declined, of course. Pat, Pat O'Reilly. Um, anyway, um, so I think part of the silence, unlike BC, 
unlike other areas where claims have happened, uh, which are seen as different. Yeah, that's just my thought on it. Yeah. Ontario. From Northern Ontario, the James Bay lands about, I heard, and I live here <laughs> now, uh, on Algonquin territory, I'm from, uh, and the Cree, and, you know, the uh, anthropologists call us different names, but we have our own tribal <laughs> names in this, in uh, on Turtle Island. So anyway, yeah, I heard a, a CBC interview uh, a month and a half ago, this man who sits on the Ottawa City Council, <coughs> he, he's, uh, his name is Steve uh, Blake. He's a city councillor. And somehow he got interviewed and um, he said um, he was planning a commemoration of the first map maker, map maker of Ontario. And, and then the CBC uh, said, who is, uh, what is the name of the map maker of Ontario, the first map maker of Ontario? Well, he arrived 350 years ago. <laughs> His name is uh, Samuel de Champlain. <laughs> he said it, you know. So I'm glad we should be promoting our, you know, our written, now that we're putting our history in written form, we should be the ones helping creating these kind of gatherings, you know. After all, we follow our traditions through the cycle, cyclical system in this country. Our languages tell us how we, how to share our values and everything that the, the Creator has provided for us on our territories on Turtle Island. That's what I wanted to, oh yeah, and he said, this man, the, the city councilor, well, I'm gonna be, um, what are we gonna, what are you gonna be, did you have money for this? You know, CBC asked him, do you have money to do this? And he said, yes, I have now collected $31,000, you know, and uh, I'm gonna ask all the restaurants in this city to um, come up with a dish to celebrate this man, in the history of this man, you know? <laughs> so anyway, I'm listening to this, and then, um, and then the CBC person asked him, well, well, that's very interesting. Um, wasn't this commemoration done already in Quebec? They celebrated, recently celebrated the 400 years having been arrived, you know, in Canada. And the government of Canada gave them $40 million to celebrate, you know, their 400 years of their arrival in this country. No, he, he couldn't answer that part. And, I, and then the CBC asked him, have you talked to the Algonquin peoples about this, your plan? He said, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Uh, the word re-indigenize caught my ear. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about what that means or uh, might involve. Um. <laughs> It, uh, it comes out of some work that I've been doing with, a with the Council of Canadians and a group in the United States called On the Commons. And uh, it really is about finding ways to uh, govern ourselves in more indigenous ways, to look at the comparison, well, to, to really study language and to study indigenous governance. Uh, to find ways that we can live in harmony with uh, with the ecology that we live in, and so that we can uh, uh, sort of uh, really take advantage of the replenishment cycles without destroying them. Um, and so it's, but it's also something that uh, individuals can do. Um, get to know your watershed. Get to know where the water flows, where it comes from, where the where the high water is. Um, Get get to know the land and what what grows there, um, because uh, it's going to be impacted and it's going to change, uh, and it's always changed. So there's all sorts of things that you can do. You know, some people talk about the uh, the hundred mile diet, but 
you know, I don't care about the 100 mile diet uh, because that just draws a circle like this. It's another geometric form, but it doesn't, doesn't conform to the actual ecosystem in which you live. Get to know and, and, and live off the ecosystem without damaging it. That's what re-indigenizing is. Anybody can do that. You don't have to be Algonquin, you don't have to be Cree, you don't have to be Salagi, you don't have to be Irish. Anybody can learn to do that. Um, I just wanted to, to say something about the education system and to thank Dad, I'm very proud of his courage, actually. So, just acknowledging that. Um, <laughs> um, education's been used as one of the primary weapons in, in colonization, so it's not really surprising that none of us would know anything because that's what education for everybody has been about, making sure that that history, the actual history of this land is not known, is forgotten, and then it becomes really, really, really easy to justify an entitlement to something that was never yours and to be able to make that story happen. Um, so I think something we can do now is when we have books like this, um, and there's many, there's some awesome, awesome indigenous presses out there, and there's some good academic work happening, um, that we go to our, our local school boards who are crying for indigenous content because they have been mandated without any support, <laughs> right? To actually uh, fulfill uh, indigenous content and which, first of all, instills, I think, a sense of pride in those of us that are indigenous, and I want to see that more and more, um, and also allows people to confront in the school system <coughs> the, the real history. I mean, even me, I was just doing some research because we have to do our defending our protest, and I discovered Dudley's just outside of Smith Falls, and Duncan Campbell Scott, does everybody know who that man is? Okay, he's Canada's answer to the final solution. So he was really it. Like he was the, the, the guy who wrote really bizarre poetry. <laughs> and he was, uh, he, he really wanted the, the residential schools to, to happen and he systematically made them happen and protected those schools. Um, he was educated in Smith Falls. His high school education was Smith Falls. He was indoctrinated right there. Out those formative years of where, you know, we go beyond what we learn as young people and trust and all that, and we get into that critical mind. That's where he learned it. That's all I have to say. <laughs> and Heather, by the way, has a huge role to play in this book. Same as Bond did. <laughs> No, in, in, in really helping uh, me to sort out stuff, especially about the old uncle mind thing. So I wanted to thank you. <laughs> Did you say, like, we, we had only five minutes, about yeah. ten minutes ago? <laughs> so how do we wind this up? Is there a song? 